Hello, Sven. How are you? How are you? Good. Look at you looking like the rock star you are. How are you? Ooh. You look great, as usual. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, it's nice to age well, isn't it? Uh, you, you've mastered it. Ah, uh, we have. Yeah. So, Sven from Badass Counseling, welcome back. Thank you. Great to be back, Chantel. We had an awesome conversation last time. Mm -hmm. like, Agreed. Time flies when you're having fun. And we spent a lot of time together and it definitely flew by. And we made a promise last time that we were going to get back together and talk about men. And specifically that you had asked me, well, what, you know, what should we talk about next time? And I said, why do men follow you? Oh, why do men follow me? So, you know, my language, we have selfish short-term thinkers who are guys. We have generous long-term thinkers who are men. Um, guys are particularly interested in my message because my message is wait three months for a first kiss and guys and girls, right, are impatient with, with their desires. I want what I want when I want it. Um, men are a different breed of mindset. And I'm not saying that we can't switch from one to the other. I've been in girl mode. I'm now in woman mode. Um, I know men who've been in guy mode themselves. Men love what I say because my message is accountability, responsibility, and logic. And that's a man mind frame. Hmm. Makes sense. And what do you think it is above all else uh, that you challenge the most in men? What I, what I challenge in people is ego. In people is ego. Is Say a little more. Um, so ego is, is the part of you that says you have to fit me, right? Like, I don't feel good about what you're wearing. So you have to wear something different. I don't feel good about who you're talking to. So you have to not talk to those people. And ego wants to control in order to satisfy itself. Ego also doesn't want to take responsibility for its own behaviors. Um, I took part in a fight with you. So fire meeting fire, but I'm not taking responsibility for the fact that I yelled and I called you a name. Interesting. Makes sense. Makes sense. I love it. That's why men like me, because I make sense. And, and so I speak man and the man language is the language of logic. Got it. Got it. That's great. Good for you. I think it's awesome. So why do women follow you? <laughs> Poor judgment. Um, I, <laughs> why do women follow me? Well, it's interesting because, for instance, on TikTok, just them, they give me the analytics of my followers and, and so forth. Um, and I'm at about, I think, like 55 or 59 percent female followers and then the rest male. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I challenge everyone's thinking. I think what it is and it's, it's the hard truths and it's, but not just that it's the hard questions and taking them deep. I think ultimately one of the things that everyone is looking for is I very much believe people want someone that they can talk about their own deepest shit with someone who actually gives a shit, someone who's going to make it about them rather than bring it back being about me um, or giving my opinions or my judgments or whatever. And I think so for women, it's um, I think they appreciate a man's perspective, just as I'm sure men appreciate a woman's perspective. Um, but I think every person wants to dive into their shit. I really believe that. I very much believe that. And um, and so for women in particular, I think because it's hard and it's ugly. And I think a lot of women definitely want to look at the hard, ugly stuff, painful as it may be, the deep, ugly stuff. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Okay, let's dive into men. I got some questions for you. Sure. The biggest question um, myself and my listeners want to know is what can we as women do to help our male partners have good mental health? Oh, that's great. Love that question. Uh, a couple of things. One, <clears throat> I tell people all the time that I don't buy the myth that men um, don't aren't emotionally uh, as advanced as women. I don't buy it. I just don't fucking buy it. Because, and I'm getting to my, your answer, the answer to your question. Because so many women say, you know, I want a man who uh, you know calls me on my shit. Well, if you're so fucking emotionally advanced, why the fuck do you need somebody to call you on your shit? Call yourself on your own fucking shit. So, but with regard to men, um, 
uh, give me the state the question again. Use different language if you could, just so I'm tight on what precisely you're asking, please. Uh, so in relationships, we are often like as people, as individuals, we're going through life and things are affecting our mental health, mm -hmm. um, that traffic, that shitty job, those shitty people, my family members, um, going through even just like, em like hormonal blues, right? Like happiness isn't a constant. It comes right. and goes just like right. sadness and depression comes and goes. And so my partner is being affected outside of my relationship in terms of mental health because of things that they can't control. Right. What can I do inside of our relationship to help right. balance that out? Okay. So if you want to get a man to open up and opening up is a big part of mental health, being able to just talk about your shit. That's why we go to a therapist. One, if you really want him to talk, then shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up with your own fucking commentary on what I'm saying. It's like so many of my clients, they say, well, I would go to my parents or I go to my dad and I share my stuff, but I get two sentences in and then he's talking about how it affects him or, or my mom is saying, oh, it makes me feel so bad that I did that to you. You didn't make it about her. Don't make it about you, ladies. Don't make it about you. That if you, if you want to be fucking heard, then you got to hear. And if you want him to open up, then just create safe space where there's no fucking commentary where there's no judgment. And even you can even say, and it's not disrespectful to say this, a lot of parents say this to their own children. Do you want to be heard or do you want to be fixed? Do you want, do you want me to just listen or do you want me to actually give uh, advice and counsel? And then it's up to the male to be responsible enough to just say, I just need you to listen today. I had a shitty day. I just need somebody to listen and understand and so forth. So that's one is uh, just don't make it about you. Don't make it about you. And it's very easy to do that. You listen for a couple of minutes and then it's back to me talking. So you're saying you don't really want his feelings. Um, and then, but what really precedes that is the question, are you a big enough vessel to hold, contain? I don't mean hold down like contain, but just to hold his problems. Yeah. The part of the reason a, a, a good therapist, for instance, is a good therapist is because no matter what you put in her lap or his lap, seen it before. It doesn't phase me, but some therapists can't handle it. It's like, whoa, whoa, a little scary here. I don't want to deal with your, whatever your problem might be. Well, it's the same way in a relationship. How much can you handle? And it's okay to say I can't handle much more, but then there have to be other avenues for him to get his shit out, whether it's other friends or a therapist or something, but we all have the right to get it out. Okay. So that's one He's asking yourself, am I a big enough vessel to contain his problems and then be fucking quiet about it Two. um, is there an equal or equitable distribution of, um, um, oh, I hate this phrase, but holding space to the other person. In other words, do you listen as much as you belabor it, all of your problems? Are you listening as much as you're talking about problems? And it could be that he just doesn't want to talk about problems because it's always about your fucking problems. So the third thing is do not, do not bring a lot of guys won't open up because they know in the next fight, it's going to be thrown in my fucking face. In other words, I can't trust you. Yeah. Right. And so what, so it's, am I big enough? Can I actually handle it? And it's, am I allowing room for it? Allowing room for him to talk. And also, am I, we am I ever weaponizing it? And if you want to shut anybody down, this is male or female. You want to shut anybody down, weaponize the stuff they share with you when they're on sacred ground. When they are opening up, go ahead, please. Oh, Does no, no, like, like you are absolutely spot on. I love this. Um, I call it making listening noises, right? When he's talking. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then you can say, how did you feel about that? Yeah. And that's it. And also have silence. Like men, most men, when they're talking, they'll say a sentence or two or three, and then they stop talking. And women often will fill that space in because they think that's having a conversation about something. They're done talking. I'm going to converse with them. Um, but when you actually stay silent, then the next words pop into their head and they divulge the next piece of information. So leaving space for silence, letting them fill in those silences is how you will get more communication from a man. Um, and, and like you're saying, not filling it in with your own story and your own experiences, because now you are turning it back on to yourself, but just creating an environment where they feel they can fill the space in with their thoughts and feelings. And they're just being listened to. Mm -hmm. I agree. And, and, you know, it's interesting in sales, 
one of the things they say is, uh, you know, whoever talks first loses. Once the offer is on the table or all the facts have been laid out, whoever talks first loses. And so I think about that sometimes. It's sometimes it's growing comfortable with just the silence. Yeah. And sometimes it's, it's like it's similar, can be similar to dealing with a team. But sometimes that silence finally gives them room that I don't have to rush because they're feeling anxiety, just like a teenager. Teenagers don't naturally share their feelings. Oftentimes it has to be coaxed out. And the same with guys. And if there's room, if we're not, I'm not going anywhere. We're just sitting here. Yeah. And then finally they work up the courage uh, to let them out. Um, and so let me ask, uh, sort of reverse the question back for you. And that is, what do you think the biggest thing is that, um, women do, or that, what do you think the biggest thing is that women do to corrupt the mental health of a relationship, of a relationship, not just what yeah. she's doing to him, but how, how do women most, um, cause the relationship at, at the sort of a mental health level to go bad? I love that you asked this because that's exactly what I wanted to say. Um, so your question absolutely prompts what I wanted to say next. Not to say that I was listening right. to the intent of talking. Um, but Stop reading my mind, would you? Ah, dude, you and I. Okay. All right, that's it. Go ahead. So being able to be with a man in silence is vital to a man's well-being because men like to just be. And sometimes they will simply be quiet. Sometimes you'll be in the quiet place in your head, or sometimes you're thinking about things. Sometimes you're trying to not think about things and you're just watching TV, wanting to be distracted and just wanting to let go. And so you are quiet. And the best thing that we can do as a partner is be able to be quiet with you and not have to fill the silence with talk. And I think the worst thing that we do as partners is we view the silence as a negative and we go into overthinking and insecurity. And then we demand that you perform in order to ease our anxiety. We demand that you tell us everything is okay. We demand that you have conversations in order to fill in the silence, to feel like we are having a relationship instead of simply being quiet. Like women are uncomfortable with their men being quiet and uncomfortable being quiet beside their men way too often. And so they go into overthinking and insecurity and they vomit that onto their partner, make their partner responsible for their thoughts and emotions because they couldn't handle the quiet. Yeah, that's really great. It's funny you bring that up because uh, I, I, I've said before, and it's, it's, it's tactical tactics and it's, it's cruel. And, but occasionally I'll have someone ask me, you know, somebody's really hurting me or my girlfriend's hurting me or we're breaking up and she's just been an asshole. And what should I do, Sven? And I'm normally all for talk it out, you know, just be play above board and so forth. But Sven, if I were, if I wanted to sort of like, you know, hit her, not physically hit her, but hit her back because she's being so mean, what do you do? And I always tell people, you want to know the one thing that women hate most? And they're like, no, what is it? What is it? I'll say, and I, I tell this to my female clients. And I, I help them see their blind spot. You're vulnerable to one thing in particular, not all, but uh, many of the women I counsel and it's silence. Mm -hmm. You ever want to drive it woman fucking nuts? Just go silent. Right. Just go fuck because precisely what you're saying, all those fears and anxieties bubble up. If we're not interacting, it's not a relationship. If we're not interacting. I'm not getting a read on, you know, where am I at? Where am I at? Similar. It's sort of the antithesis of that or the opposite of that is I always, you know, and when I was younger, all right, not anymore, I'm not, you know, but if you ever really want to get in a woman's pants, you want to know what you do? Do you want to know what the single biggest fucking aphrodisiac is for a woman? Be as insanely honest as you possibly can. Yeah. Literally tell everything. I would be on first dates. I would be on first dates with a woman back when I was younger. And I would say, listen, I believe in a woman's right to say no and all that. I totally believe in it. All right. But. The problem for that in sex, excuse me, is I'm always having to ask for permission. Can I touch this? Uh, can we go down here now? You know, I'm always waiting for fucking permission. And it puts this sort of halting flavor to the sex. And it's just like, fuck this shit. What am I, six? Fuck off. You know what? I'm going to tell you in advance everything I'm going to do to you, everything I want to do with you. I'm going to tell you everything. And you can say no. I just get to determine when you say no. So in other words, I'm going to tell you right now, I've done it before on the first date, back when I was younger, in my 40s. 
I would literally put everything out there on the first date, every single thing I'm ever going to do to you. And you, and if you don't want to do it, that's totally fine. I got no problems with that. I'm still going to buy dinner. We can still have a lovely time, you know, talking this evening. I'll still pick up the check. I think you're great, but we're not going to go any further. Okay. So you can say no to any or all of it, but you got to say no now because I'm not going to do that asking for shit. It's like treating me like I'm a fucking six-year-old. And so I'd put it out there and it's fascinating. Some women are just like, what the fuck? But anybody who has already come to the point where they're having a first date with me, they already know I'm a bit odd. So that's fine. Right. So I put it out there. And it, it, crazy as it sounds, it's a fucking aphrodisiac. When you tell a woman the absolute truth, exactly how you are feeling right now, exactly what I, where I was last night, or even if you, you know, we've all been in that situation where you cheated on somebody or you kissed another girl or whatever, tell her, tell her exactly what happened. Just put it in front of her. If I'm being totally honest, here's what happened. Here's what happens. Here's well, what were you feeling? I was feeling this. I was feeling this. I was feeling this because what provides the, what causes the insecurity isn't the act itself. It's the not knowing mm -hmm. it's the not knowing it's always the fucking cover up, and they sense it. People sense it and women will sense something's off. And that's, what's causing that anxiety inside. But the more truth you lay in front of a woman, it's, you want to know why she then spreads her legs? Because she trusts you. Mm -hmm. She trusts you. Because you've just told her everything. So anyway, got off on a bit of a tangent there. But anyway. I love how honest my husband is. Um, and, and just to kind of like roll back to a point that you made. Um, it is important to accept the truth, even when you don't like it. It's important to be non-reactive to the truth, even when you don't like it. And I say to my women, go vent to your girlfriends if he says something that you're not happy with, but don't make them pay for the truth. Because if you do, like either either give them shit in the moment um, or, or swing it back around, like you bring it back up in a fight. If you make them pay for telling you the truth, you will no longer get the truth. Right. No, I love that. And the, the, and the other side of it is you don't have to agree with the truth. You can have an opposing truth. And what one of the things, uh, you know, my girlfriend and I, that we, we talk about, and we're both sort of learning is that if I have an opposing truth, to, if she feels the need, I need to share some sacred stuff, man, or some deep stuff or whatever. And if I disagree, or if I feel, well, that's not really what the story is, or, or in this case, apologies. Right. If, if she apologizes to me, let's say, um, or let's say I go to her and I'm apologizing, or I think you need an apology, that if the other person has a counter story, they are totally entitled to that counter story, but save that counter story for an hour from now, save it for a, a day from now. Otherwise it feels like you're just fighting back. You're defending yourself, something like that. Um, so you can have your truth. You can disagree with your mate's truth, but would it kill you to wait an hour or wait a day and then come back and say it so that precisely to your point that there's safe space so that he does feel comfortable. Okay. This is a place where I can lay my truth. And even if we disagree that she's not going to overwhelm me with her truth or her opinions and so forth. I, I love your point on that. So here's another question. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I get uh, women who have husbands, boyfriends, partners who, um, are going through something like, like death of a close family member, right? Mm -hmm. so, so they're going through something devastating. And my people want to know, what can you do? What can you do for somebody? What can you do when your partner is going through something that's really pulling them down into a depression? Their mental health is, is going. Well, I think some of what we've been talking about already, um, allowing them to talk, if you want to talk, and very often the opening is just if if you want to talk when you're ready to talk I'm here, and uh, and then unfortunately it doesn't always come at the most convenient times. But you really got to be able to fucking stop on a dime if it's coming up when you're driving to the next party or whatever. Um, the other thing that you can do is gently recommend it, it just in, everybody needs someone to talk to, and maybe it's not going to be you. Maybe it is going to be you, but that they have someone else and asking the question, do you have someone that you can talk to about this? And if your guy is at such a place that he doesn't talk to any of anybody about his fucking problems, then you've got a much bigger problem because that means if he's that at that age state at 25 or 30 or 35, that means he's likely been that way the whole time. And he's got a lot of pent up shit anyway. Right. Um, and so you can encourage him and I'm here and I'm willing to listen. 
Uh, you can ask gently without forcing or saying there's anything wrong with him, but it, do you have someone else you can talk to? Um, would it feel good to talk to someone else? And maybe that someone else is a, uh, an adult male in his life, or maybe it's, you know, his oldest friend, or maybe it's a, you know, a therapist. Um, but before you, if you're going to invite him to open up to you and sure, sort of share his stuff with you, you got to ask yourself if you have a bandwidth for it. Mm-hmm. And at what point you don't have a bandwidth for it, because you have every right to and need to protect yourself and your own, you know, because it's easy, you know, what do lifeguards do? You would think the single biggest thing they do when they go in for a drowning victim is they got to make sure that the drowning victim doesn't pull them down too. Yes. Right, right. Um, but encouraging them to open up so that they're talking. If they're talking to you and you feel comfortable and you can still receive that and hear that and hold that, you know, sort of safe space for them, that's fantastic. If you can't, or if they would feel more comfortable talking to someone else, it's that. But ultimately, the bottom line is, is as you well know, Shanta, and as, as you well know, that in any lifetime, there are going to be multiple times where there's just seriously, seriously heavy shit. Yeah. Nobody escapes life without pain. Pain, life is very fair in that regard. Nobody escapes life without pain. And so, yeah, the question becomes, how are you going to navigate that? And if you really want to be savvy, if you're a woman in a relationship and you really want to be savvy, you'll anticipate before you get into that, that situation, you'll anticipate and you'll uh, that stuff happening. And you'll be asking the questions of, hey, sweetheart, what do you think we should do? What do you think we need to have in place when the storms come? Mm-hmm. Do you have asking in advance? Do you have someone that you can talk to? And I'm happy to do you feel comfortable trusting me with some of your problems? And it sounds like a strange conversation to have. But what a wonderful conversation to have in advance. Deliberate. That's deliberate be relationshiping. It's yeah. thinking this shit out in advance. What are your thoughts on it? I love that. I love, I love getting that in advance because, um, you know, listen, my sister passed away, right? Mm. I was 17. She was, oh, God. so like it was, you know, you don't know how to handle yourself, let alone tell people how to handle you. Um, so I think asking that ahead of time, like, what should I do when you find yourself in that place? Like your mom is dying. Is there anything you need me to do ahead of time to help you prepare for this? Is there anything you're going to need me to do during that time as you're going through the pain of it? Um, right. And, and, you know, of course, just being really understanding and accommodating when somebody is going through something tough and not making it about you. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my husband's mom passed away. It's COVID. There's only 20 people allowed in the funeral home. He's like, do you mind not coming to the funeral so we can get more close family members? And I'm like, absolutely no beautiful. problem. Right. Beautiful. That's a beautiful act on your part. Beautiful. Yeah. So mm-hmm. here's another one. Sure. Uh, so woman is, she has a partner. He's depressed he's barely going to work or he's lost his job he's not looking for a new job he's always on the couch he's always playing video games the reason for not cleaning the reason for not bathing the reason for not getting a job or going to work for the reason for not being financially responsible is i'm depressed it's been going on for several months she comes to you sven and says what do i do about this what's your advice to her in all honesty she can't solve it this is bigger than her What should she do about it? She can't even, you can't even navigate a relationship. What needs to happen, I mean, if I'm really honest, he needs to be in counseling with me specifically. Um, And then it doesn't solve your problem. I realize you're asking on behalf of your viewers. In all honesty, what I would tell her is get your own ass in counseling. Because this shit, the simple fact that you're asking me that question says it's already dragging you down. Right. And so if you, and, and yes, you can recommend that he see a therapist. What if he doesn't, you can recommend, you know, and you can, in, in, in uh, clearly your anxiety over it is bouncing off of him. It's not changing his fucking behavior, but it doesn't change that. You still have the anxiety. You got to take care of you. And that's really serious shit. You want to see something just spin out of control very, very rapidly. It's that sort of situation, but Susie isn't taking care of herself. Yeah. And Susie has to take care of herself because otherwise what she's doing is she's saying our happiness as a couple and hence my happiness is tied up in whether or not you get your ass off the sofa and whether or not you put down the video games or whatever. And it's like, Susie, you can't do that. And so many of the women that I counsel, their happiness is tied up in what Steve is doing. 
Yeah. It's just like, no, 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 Susie, come on. I get it. We all want love and so on and so forth. But you've, you've got to go into the healing of you, not just the care of you and coping skills, the healing of you. And it's scary because you may discover you outgrow Steve or whatever. But the bottom line is, because obviously if someone's going to change, if the other person isn't changing in somewhat compatible ways, the relationship's fucked. But no, Susie has to take care of herself. Absolutely. So, and, and you, you, you can you bounced into this, right? So should Susie stay? Well, and that's a great question. So first of all, um, you can only make a, my mother, as you say, uh, don't make a, any sort of decision past nine o'clock at night. Her point is we don't make good decisions when we're tired, when we're fatigued, nothing's going to fatigue you more than your own fucking misery. Nothing's going to disrupt your sleep, your eating patterns, your exercise, all the things that make us healthy and help us to make good decisions. Nothing's going to corrupt that more than your own anxieties and fears and ego shit and all of that, which is being largely uh, determined by Steve's inaction. All right. So that's why you getting all your feelings out. If it's your girlfriends, if it's your therapist, if it's your priest, if it's your dating coach, whomever you're paying or not paying or whatever, you got to get. Okay. So once you get all the anxiety out, then. Why? Because then you're acting from a place of center. And the question becomes, what feels right to me? And very often it's not, should he leave Steve or should she leave Steve or not leave Steve? It's a question of what do I feel? And do I have the courage to execute it? Mm -hmm. See, they, the woman may know the answer. She may know she wants to leave, but it's scary as shit. Not, not just because I, I don't want to hurt Steve's feelings. I still love and care about him. I just don't want to be with him anymore. Um, and, but, you know, it's just a pain in the ass. Breaking a relationship sucks. It just sucks. All right. But who do you, I would say to Su Susie, Susie, what is the one sentence? If you were to leave Steve, what is the one sentence above all else you most fear or, or would be most painful to hear from someone or to know they're thinking about you? In one sentence or less, what is it you really fear? What's the one thing? Because that's what she's running from. And then the second question I always ask is, and whose voice would it be most painful to hear that sentence from? Very often, not always, very often, Susie's um, uh, sort of anxiety or fear reticence in leaving Steve has nothing to do with Steve. Right. Very often, it's mom or dad. Right. That she's still answering to that power source. Steve is just the avatar for mom or dad. She's terrified, but she's terrified of somebody's voice. She's terrified of some judgmental voice that if I actually listen to my own fucking feelings, mm -hmm. I know exactly what my mother will say, or I know exactly what so-and-so will say. It's the response. And that's the shit Susie's been getting her whole fucking life. And so this notion of doing something as bold as walking away, mm -hmm. it's just like, there's, there's going to be so much fear wrapped up in that. So what I would say to Susie is what ultimately is the fear here? And that one sentence thing that I do is just one way of getting at what the fear is, because that's what keeps you, Susie from doing it. But here's how you know whether or not to leave or when it's time to leave. Um, first of all, is it persisting? Is it persisting? It, despite, you know, imploring and so on and so forth. If it's persisting, um, what I always tell people is if you have to think about it, it's not time yet. Mm. If you have to think about it, it's not time yet. I just tell people as much as you can't let the decision go, just let it go. Because I guarantee you're going to be getting up, you're going to get up to use the restroom in the middle of the night, or you're going to be getting your box of, uh, you know, Rice Krispies in the aisle at the grocery store. And it's going to hit you yeah. when you don't expect it. And it's just, I don't even give a shit anymore. It's time. I'm done. And you'll know. And it's not a believing. It's not a hoping. It's not a thinking about. It's not a figuring out. It's just, I know. And when you know, and particularly, and here's, a, here's an important one for men or women, but especially women, when you know you've done everything you possibly can, when you know you've tried everything, when you know there's nothing left I can do, you get a fucking clarity that you've never had in your life before. You get a strength you have never had in your life before. When you know you've tried everything, it's like, fuck it, I'm done. I just know I'm done. This is, it's great. Steve, you're not a bad person. I'm just done. Does that make any sense? I call it earning your way out. Yeah, I love it. Love it. Yeah. Pain is, and pain is such a, I think we talked about this last time, pain is such a powerful motivator. I love pain in, in so far as that we, it gets so bad, accumulates so much that we reach a point of what I call the fuck it point. 
fuck it, where the, it gets so bad. And all of a sudden today, I have the courage to do what just yesterday I didn't have the courage to do. That's the power of pain. But not only the, the, the courage, but you have the clarity. I wasn't sure. I was figuring out what I would. And once you hit that fuck it point and a fuck it point, if you think you might be at the fuck it point, you're not at the fuck it point. Right. The fuck it point is when you don't even fucking care anymore. Fuck off. I'm doing it anyway. I don't care what people think of me or I don't care if I'm going to lose half of my income because of his lazy ass or I don't care. Blah, blah, blah. I don't care anymore. I got to do it. Yeah. So Steve comes to you and he goes, Sven, it's been four months. I'm not getting myself out of this. I'm not motivated to go to work. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm spending like an idiot. Uh, Susie's going to leave me because I'm mm-hmm. not getting my ass in gear. And I just don't know what to do. I'm so depressed. What do you tell? Mm-hmm. I tell Steve, first of all, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's hard. I've been there. I'm sorry. And uh, second of all, what I tell him is if I'm really honest with you, Steve, the shit going on in your life has nothing to do with the shit going on in your life. This shit going on in your life, this depression is not caused by anything that's in your life right now. It's caused by that shit back there that you've got. So you've got a 500 pound bag of fucking rocks on your back that you've been carrying around for about 30 years. And it's all that shit. And if you really want to come out of depression, I mean, like solve it, not just like get above it for as best you can and try to keep your head above the water line and keep breathing air. If you want to solve it, you got to look at that shit. That's why, that's what my books are about. It's like getting those, every, see, every time you hurt someone, every time someone gets hurt, it's like one more rock in the bag, right? But the biggest rocks are from the most powerful people in your life, mom, dad, mainly. And so those rocks got to come out. You don't ever necessarily even have to confront the person. I can heal you without you ever confronting them, but you have to slay the voice of the parent inside. And you have to slay the beliefs that they pressed into the cement, the wet cement of your soul. And so that's what I'd tell Steve. And, I, and here's the kicker though. Here's the kicker. And this is where I disagree with most therapists and where I radically disagree with our culture, one significant cultural belief. And it's simply this. And if I could change one thing about the mental health profession, spiritual health profession, if I could change one thing, it's this. Healing does not have to take a long fucking time. Mm -hmm. And and there's there's a saying, and I don't know who said it. I want to say it was somebody like Carl Jung or somebody. I don't fucking know who said it. I know that I read a long time ago. I've Googled it a million times. I can't find it, but I've come to see it in my own practice. And it's simply this transformation can be immediate if you go deep enough. Now, and by immediate, my client, most my average client lasts with me between three and five months. And by the time we're done, they're on their feet. There's it's a completely different self. Very often it's in the first two sessions. Yeah. You know, granted, my first session is you know between four and six hours, but the point is, it doesn't have to take a long fucking time. And one of the reasons people don't want to touch that shit is not just because it's so overwhelming. One of the reasons they've been running from that tidal wave of all their fucking pain, just staying a step ahead of it, staying busy, staying distracted, is because they're terrified of being overwhelmed. They're terrified of, if I bring that shit up, now I'm stuck with it. And it's going to be with me forever. So they think, oh, I'll just keep it back down as if that's solving the fucking problem. No, they're terrified of it. Terrified of being overwhelmed. Terrified of it lasting a long time. And it doesn't have to. And so what Steve needs to do, if I'm really honest with Steve, there, there is no quick fix. There is no any wallpaper you can paper over that. There's no swift kick in the ass. Well, you just need a kick in the ass, Steve, and get off the sofa. It won't last. It won't fucking last. If something is so fucking strong that it's bogging down someone who has otherwise been a productive, you know, normal person in society, that says there's some serious inner shit going on. So yeah. I'd tell him to heal that. He's got to start healing that shit. Yeah. And I I want to encourage women to be observant of the person that they're with. Like if you're with somebody who's always had a problem with motivation and mental health and managing their emotions and their behaviors, leave, leave, do not stay and hope this is going to change. I call that hoping games. Don't play hoping games. Yes. We have the power to change ourselves. Do not stay and hope somebody's going to change themselves. But, um, and, but, but Chantel, I'm sorry, that's predicated on yeah. that only happens if Susie in the early part of the relationship, and I agree with you 2000%, somebody else's mental baggage is not yours. It's not going to fucking magically change. 100% agree with you. But Susie's ability to walk away in the beginning 
is based on her own relationship with her past. Because very often the people that are hoping a relationship or, oh, I think he's going to change or I'm going to stay, I'm going to overlook the red flags. If I'm doing that, it's because of my own fucking insecurities and what I believe about myself. I'm not good enough. So I guess it's a whole better I can get run with it. I interrupted. Go ahead. Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And this is why I say no kissing for three months, 12 character traits, make sure it's there before you kiss them. Mm-hmm. Um, but I want I wanted to get that in, you know, to kind of clarify there's, there's there's times when you're assessing and you need to go. If, if you're sitting here listening to this right now and going, eh, he's always had a problem with this, leave today. You got to go. But let, my husband, we've been together for 16 years. Forever, he's been a rock. Even in his darkest, worst times, you wouldn't see it because he is a rock. He's And, and the thing is, he's a rock for so many people. He's a rock for people. Mm-hmm. Um so he's, he's, he's always been in control of his behavior. He's always been in control of his emotions. Of course, we had some fight in the 10 years. Of course, we lost our shit a few times in the 10 years. Those are extenuating circumstances. Um, my husband has always been hardworking, always been financially responsible, always been generous, always been at the service of others. Right. Now, given this history, if my husband were to go into a depression and recluse and turn into himself and become less productive as a result of this depression, because let's say all these years of being a rock and now he's crumbling, I would look at him and I would, I would say to myself personally, I would say, I give him three years. Like I would actually give a time frame, like I did when he moved his business from a small location he rented to a big location he owned, all the eggs are in the basket. Um, if one month didn't make a 20 20 percent profit, the bank took it, right? And so there's a lot of pressure going on here. And I said to myself, I'm giving him three years. I'm giving three years of not needing him at all, of me being okay, not needing his time, not needing anything from him. Um, and and because I know he needs to focus. So I'm not going to pull on his emotions. I'm not going to pull on his time. He needs to focus 100% on achieving this and getting through that hump of stress and anxiety. Um, and he did suffer through it. And there were moments where he vomited on me because he was going through so much emotionally. Mm-hmm. And I made a point because, you know, listen, I'm all about the no fighting, right? And so I had already got into that no fighting mind frame. And uh, when he did vomit on me and basically use me as a lightning rod, like Ugh. here's this overabundance of stress, fear, and anxiety. And mm-hmm. you're the one I'm going to, you know, do this to. I didn't default to anger. Anger is a secondary emotion. Hurt is the primary emotion that he caused in those moments. And so I stayed with the hurt on my face and I simply said, that's not fair. And then he'd, he'd of course, come to himself and go, yeah, I'm sorry, that wasn't right. Um, So if my husband, after 16 years of being a responsible, hardworking, strong person were to go into a depression, I would give him some time, right? I, I would give some grace and some time uh, and some space for him to work through his depression and come back out of it and be the person that I remember. I love it. I think that's great. Uh, out of curiosity, um, honest question. Um, how'd you get the number three years or um, where does that come from? Is it <laughs> random or it just feels right for you? Yeah, That's what yeah. I, that's what I'm willing to give. I'm willing to give three years. Oh, is that sort of what it is? It's, it's, um, I wanted to come up with a number that felt realistic in terms mm-hmm. of gauging how long it would take for the dust to settle mm-hmm. in, in, because this is a massive move. It's caused a lot of uncertainty in his life. Mm-hmm. He needs to be really super focused on work and, and get into the groove and understand how things are working out. And that's going to take some time. Sure. And so I, it did not take that much time, but because I said to myself three years, right? Like, you know, under promise over deliver. Right. And so I, you know, I wanted to make sure that I was setting myself up to be accepting of how long it took. I think and it's great. You know, like when, when it came to not fighting with my husband, we fought for 10 years in the dog training world. And I was a dog trainer before I was a people trainer. So in the dog training world, you take the amount of time that the negative behavior is taking place divided in half. And that's how long with consistent application of now a new set of behaviors, you can see the better outcome. And so I said to myself, we've been fighting for 10 years. So it's going to take five years for our relationship to settle into fully being okay with not fighting anymore. It took four Right. So again, Hey, profit. Right. Yeah. Right. right. So 
um, that's what I encourage people to do. When I'm coaching people, I always like to stay realistic. I, I, I say, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to say we're going to remove jealousy altogether. I'm going to teach you how to de-escalate yourself from jealousy and insecurity. And so giving ourselves a timeline um, that get, that will make us pleasantly surprised in essence yeah. at the outcome, because it's a, it's a shorter timeline because of our consistent application of the right kind of behaviors really sets us up for success instead of failure. I think that's fantastic. Um, I want to back up on something you said. Um, I like your, your notion of de-escalation uh, as it applied to jealousy. Um, my girlfriend and I, that we sort of talk about that with regard to fights. See, she grew up in an all-Italian family in the 60s and 70s in the Bronx. All right. Parents, parental lineage, one from Sicily, the other from Positano. Uh-huh. Hardcore Italian family. Everybody's got a fucking opinion. Right. Everybody's got a big mouth. I come from quiet Swedes up in the far north, uh, way up in northern Minnesota. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm the youngest of six and mostly, well, basically all brothers, one sister, but she's considered, she was a guy. Uh-huh. For most and purposes. But the point is. Uh, the point is, is, you know, quiet people really Swedes are, you know, we're rock, but bo- we're fucking boring. And I never fit in I had a big mouth. So what I'm getting at is, you know, I, I had two wives before that very extraordinarily intense women. And yeah, Karen, my girlfriend is as well. Uh, but you know, we're, we're in our fifties now, so we both mellowed it out, but Karen and I, we don't try to eliminate the fights per se. I mean, Karen started the company 25 years ago and built it herself. She's been president and primary shareholder since day one, built it into an $80 million company with 2,500 employees globally. This is a fierce fucking woman, but she's also an extremely gentle, one of the kindest people I've ever met. And so, and uh, I run the full gamut. I, you know, I'm very big personality, but I'm also uh, reclusive and quiet and uh, I need my time to recharge and, and I try to be gentle and so forth. And so the point is, Two people living authentically at all levels of their energy, not just modulated at one speed, that there's a dimmer switch on on my energy. And sometimes it's all the way up. Sometimes it's down. Sometimes she might bump that switch and it goes. And so what I talk about in my last book is the myth of the pain-free relationship. It doesn't exist. Right. It, the, the relationship where there's no conflict doesn't exist. The relationship, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be escalation. And I love, you know, I use the word too, de-escalation. Who's bringing it down? Are we bringing it down and so forth? And so there, there is no pain for relationship. What there is, is there's contrition and forgiveness. Mm-hmm. There's always going to be the bumping of elbows and the bruising of ribs. There's that in any relationship where you're living in close proximity or working with there's going to be that. And so the question becomes, and I'll, I'll pose it for your women and for your men that follow you, because I know you have a, a male, quite a male following as well. Do you have the ability to say, I was wrong? Mm. Do you have the ability to say, I'm sorry and mean it? Because you create a power imbalance. You humble yourself. You give someone power over you when you say, I'm sorry, I hurt you. And that was wrong. Do you have the ability to forgive? I did a TikTok recently on a woman. She ended up becoming my wife. And it took me a while. I was a little slow learner back then who, uh, because I said something wrong, not even hurtful, not even deliberate. And uh, she had, she was, we were going to be seeing each other, but we hadn't seen each other in a while because she was on the road for her work. And she said, Sven, I really need to see you. And I said, well, I don't need to see you, but I really want to see you. I'm so excited to see you. And she took, she was so offended. She took a month. She did not talk to me for a month. She punished me for a month. And so for me, what that's indicative, even though I apologize for hurting her feelings and so on and so forth, what that's indicative for, of, for me is someone who can't forgive. Right. Right. Because if I don't forgive, I can lower the power over you. And so the question becomes, A, can you admit when you're wrong? Can you apologize and mean it? Can you forgive and mean it? And just as importantly, does your spouse, does your partner, can they admit when they're wrong? Do they admit when they've hurt you? Do they say they're sorry? And can they forgive? Because if you're with someone who doesn't, you're fucked. You you are fucked. You are going to eat so much shit in that relationship, Susie. If you're with a guy that's that way, or there are plenty of guys that are that way and women who aren't. Bill, if you're in that relationship, you're so fucked. I love your brother, but you're just, you are about to experience a fucking shit ton of pain. And the truth is, Bill's nodding his head because he's like, I know I already have. It's like, yeah, idiot, come on. 
the, and, 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 so, and so it becomes, the question then becomes to Susie, if she's doing that, allowing someone to not apologize, not admit when they're wrong, not forgive, what the fuck's going on inside of me? And I'm not blaming the victim, Susie. I'm saying, but Su- Susie, what's going on inside of you that you're allowing someone to treat you that way? And at what point do you matter enough to you? Do you value and respect yourself enough that you say, fuck this shit? And, and, and in fact, I dislike it so much that I'm even willing to be alone. Yeah. And that's that fear. I mean, that huge fear that we all have, right? That fear of being alone that keeps us eating shit. Do you see a lot of that in your work? Uh, like a, a lot of ego, right? People who are unwilling to take responsibility for, for their behaviors. That's the ego. Um, and, you know, like too often, we're not seeing what we're doing wrong in the moment, right? Because the ego is hiding all of that. Like, sure. like your brain literally fools you to how wrong you are, because if you actually understood how wrong you were all the time, you'd hate yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the ego certainly sees, keeps you from seeing in the moment, how wrong you are with reflection. When the moment is over, a lot of us will realize, Oh, you know, what? I kind of could have done that better if we start to see through the ego, but then what we'll do is we'll say, well, you know, like that, you know, it happened a few hours ago it happened a day ago i'm just not going to say anything i'm just going to let everything die off and what happens is there's the residual angst that's going on that isn't resolved until the next ego flare up and you guys have your next altercation and so there's never an, a full alleviation of right. the angst in the relationship because there's right. no apology there's no responsibility taken that's and right. i see apologies on a different level than you do you said when you apologize you humble yourself you take yourself down I say you actually empower yourself more than the other person when you do apologize. And it's a three-part apology. I'm sorry for what I did, all of it, leave them speechless. I realize that the emotional outcome I had on the person, leave them speechless. Don't leave them the opportunity to say, yeah, but you. And then the last part is, this is my plan for not doing this again, showing you, Mm -hmm. you've really thought this out. Sure. Sure. No, I love it. And and indeed, of course, it's an elevation of self. It's the uh, it's being, I mean, why do we consider a person? Why do we use the phrase a bigger person or being the bigger man? You're doing the thing, the hard thing. So certainly that person doing that is, however, by saying to someone, generally speaking, by saying to someone, I am sorry, I'm giving them power. I'm giving them, I, I'm creating a situation where they could say, yeah, motherfucker, you did fucking hurt me. You're a fucking asshole. And plenty of people do that. And why would somebody be afraid to apologize unless precisely that had happened in the past? That were very often, and and how rare is it people who willingly apologize, willingly own their shit? How common is it to pass the buck, to blame you, right? That says that there's something in that situation that's yucky. I don't want it. I don't want to apologize, right? And so anyway, right. So back to Susie. Yeah, it's like, I guess the, the thing I'm wondering about you, uh, Chantel, in your practice is, have you seen, how much do you see, I know you've seen it, but how much do you see women afraid, and, and it's with men too, but you have a lot of female followers, so let's talk to that. Women afraid to do the hard thing that they know they got to do because they're terrified of being alone. Uh, all the time. And it's just because they don't realize that the outcome is actually better than they imagined. Sure. But what I would also, in addition to that, I agree with you. In addition to that, what they're really afraid of is when I'm alone, when I'm alone, then all of those voices, all the messages that I was taught about myself, you're no good, you're fat, you're skinny, you're ugly, you're stupid. No, you don't matter. You're not wantable. All those voices that have been inside me that I've never fully healed, all of a sudden, they come up and they start running around in my head like a dryer that's on going crazy that I can't turn off and pull the clothes out of, right? So, but by a person being here, it's a buffer. It's a counter message to all those voices inside of me that got pressed into the wet cement of my soul and hardened that have been there in my whole life. See, well, at least Steve is here. So I am one. <sighs> Even though I'm eating shit day in and day out, at least I have someone. But if Steve, if I walk away from Steve, then I'm alone. Or if Steve leaves me, all those voices well up and they're so fucking scary and they beat me down. And so really the solution is at what point do you face those voices, get those out of you? Because otherwise you're going to keep holding on to crap to counter the messages you've been taught your whole life, that you're not wantable, that you don't matter, 
that you're no good, things like that. And so to what degree, I guess the question that I pose to uh, women that I work with, men that I work with, when they sort of know what they want to do, know what they need to do, but they're terrified. The question is always, what's the fear of driving the behavior? And more often than not, not always, but one of the whoppers is the fear of being alone because then I'm left alone with all those messages. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, like, you know, one of the greatest things that anyone will ever do for themselves is have a strong tribe of people. So Mm -hmm. that being single doesn't mean being alone. And sometimes people are so introverted um mm-hmm. uh, they lack some social skills and so the mm-hmm. only person they actually do have in their lives is a significant other mm-hmm. and breaking up with them for whatever reason would mean being alone and then having to start all over again going through the anxiety of trying to find somebody to care for them all over again and you know love isn't always functional mm-hmm. unfortunately and and just one follow up on that uh, very often or often enough that it's tragic and that is Often the tribe that you've had as old you is the very judgment you fear in taking the steps you need to take for you, because I know what my family's response will be. I know what my father will say. He'll say what he's always said. And very, so very often, it's not just that I have to leave Steve, as I mentioned earlier, but I have to face the onslaught of the people who call themselves my tribe, but they're not fucking supportive. Your real tribe. Yeah. Is the one as your self love grows, is the people who love you as much as you do, the people who support you, who just want you to fucking be you, who aren't trying to make you into what they still want you to be. And so, what I uh, what I would warn women, would warn men, would warn anyone is is asking yourself the question: Is my tribe really my tribe? Do they actually support me, or have they been pulling me down the whole fucking time? And at what point we talk about distancing yourself from you, you know, from Steve or from your lover or from your mate or from a job that's sucking the fucking life out of you? But if it came to your own family, yeah, would do you matter enough that you're willing to walk away if that's what it came to? Because very often it does. I have to wake, walk away from mom, and well, mom's the primary power source in the entire family, and everybody answers to mom's big fucking ego, and the myth story she's telling about how great she is, when in fact, we all know she hasn't, but if you walk away, you're on the outs, and you become, you know, she attacks, or dad can be just as easily dad, not trying to be gender, whatever, and so to walk away from the tribe, you incur the wrath of the tribe, and that's very, very hard, and a lot of people then feel trapped that I can't follow my own voice because I'm terrified of the very people that I've been so ensconced with for my whole fucking life. That's some hard shit. Yes. So we got to get some self-definition going on. There it is. There it is. I dare say two great minds, my friend. All right. All right. Well, this has been so great, Chantel. Thank you so much for having me on. Always fun. I'll talk to you again soon, my love. Thank you so much. Let's tell people where to find you. Ah, Very gracious. Badass counseling on TikTok is the primary place. Every post goes up there first. Uh, badass counseling on Instagram, badass counseling on, uh, and not fat ass. Like you called me last time, <gasps> fat ass counseling. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Uh, also on YouTube. And then on, uh, yeah, the usual stuff, go to badasscounseling.com. All of my books are there, especially there's a hole in my love cup as are my DIY video courses and several articles on different topics. And as always, it's been great Chantel. Thank you so much. Awesome. Sven. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye now. Bye.